comes Omni Da, Malet Imne Da. That does it. That's the Korean part of it. <laughs> the point being is you really could get along in the world pretty well if you learned just a little bit of somebody else's language, which uh, I had to go to a Korean boot camp in 1996. And I think I won prizes for ineptitude. You know, I had this very mean kind of DI language instructors. And I, oh, you stupid, you old man, why are you here? <laughs> now I have to get martial like, you know, get serious and stick to the business. My charge this evening is to provide a, an appreciation, it's a kind of a military term, of George C. Marshall's year of service as Secretary of Defense. And a period of time, obviously, in the most critical period of the Korean War, October 1950 to July 1951. It is really from the Chinese intervention to the time which the armistice negotiations began in 1951. I would like to tell you that General Marshall had a tremendous impact upon the course of the war, but that would be stretching it a bit. And the reason is simply that he had lots of other concerns at the same period. Uh, so there's, what I intend to do is talk a little bit about his stewardship of the Office of Secretary of Defense and some of the things that he did that continued to evolve after his departure and talk about some of the programs that he was associated with as SecDef, and then to talk, lastly, a little bit about his experience as Secretary of Defense during this critical period of the Korean War. My argument really is that Marshall's priorities were formed when he was Secretary of State, and that he simply continued to pursue those interests when he became Secretary of Defense. Those interests were the restoration of American military power, the strengthening of NATO under American, if not domination, of leading partnership, to look at the questions of continuous military readiness and preparation, and then lastly to sort out the American interest in Asia our relations not only with Korea but with Japan and China because the Korean War I think can't be really understood without realizing that it's embedded in the history of American foreign relations with the People's Republic of China and with a restored Japan. Tell you the truth, I'm preparing this I really learned a good deal that I hadn't really thought about in terms of General Marshall's contributions to to Asian security issues, not just the support of the American war effort in Korea. Considering the fact that he was in office uh, just about a year, it's September 1950, September 1951, it really is quite amazing how much effect he had. Part of it because he picked up things that were already underway strengthen the commitment to NATO, for example, and then set the stage for doing other, other uh, uh, things that had not been moving along. German rearmament was something, for example, that he had spent a great deal of time and effort working on. Let me start, first of all, by talking about Marshall's relationships with a number of people who were critical to American policy and strategy. There's no question his relations with President Truman were privileged. Truman thought that General Marshall was America's greatest federal office holder ever. I don't think he really thought about anyone else in the same, same terms. Truman's devotion to, to Marshall, and I think, was even, even struck Bob Lovett and J. Law and Collins is excessive at times. It's hard to imagine, but they felt that, that it, Marshall never exploited the relationship, but they thought very often that if General Marshall thought something was a good idea, Truman then closed his mind to other types of alternatives that might have been considered. They didn't think that Marshall made many mistakes, if any, uh, but they thought that there was a, kind of a, an imbalance uh, in terms of his 
relations. Um, Truman, I think, very clearly would rather deal with Marshall than Dean Atchison, just for, for an, as an example. Although Atchison certainly devoted to the president. The only person I, I could find that really sort of challenged Marshall's relationship with Truman was Averill Harriman, who I think is an uh, unappreciated character in this period. Uh, he always appears at different places doing important things to the point where people dealing with him thought that Harriman had just created a new job called deputy president, which they couldn't find. <laughs> they couldn't find in the Constitution, but they were clearly dealing with somebody who sort of saw himself in that, in that, that role. In terms of um, uh, Marshall's access to the president, it was um, really un unchecked by anybody. Mar Marshall said he thought he could see the president at any time, any place, within half an hour. And nobody ever challenged him on that assertion. People who deal with problems inside the Beltway know that access in the White House, uh, at least until recently maybe, was uh, a mark of, of real power and influence. Marshall's relations with people in the cabinet seemed to have been pretty good. He had uh, many contacts from his own service as Secretary of State. Um, he and Dean Acheson did, in fact, get along well, and agreed with each other most of the time. What I found interesting was that Marshall had very good relations with many of Acheson's key uh, uh, guys, uh, Paul Nitz, uh, Chip Boland. Dean Rusk, Doc Matthews, Philip Jessup, most of the names that pop up as being close to, to uh, Atchison were people with whom Del Marshall had had personal relationships for some time. In the Pentagon, his, of course, his, his loyal supporter was Bob Lovett. His picture's upstairs, it's a good thing. Uh, he certainly uh, was a devoted heir apparent. And when Marshall took the job as Secretary of Defense, part of the deal was the assumption that Lovett would be Deputy Secretary and would succeed General Marshall when the general retired again. I'm amazed uh, when you read about General Marshall's experiences when he was 69 years old, which in those days was like 80 or 90, uh, having, having passed into that barrier of if I'm weird, it's my meds. Uh, some of you probably have <laughs> had that experience. Uh, it, it, it is it's kind of awesome when you realize that uh, Marshall lived in an age when he couldn't pop as many pills as most of us do now because they didn't, they didn't exist yet. And yet the level of energy was, was adequate enough. And I think one of the things was he I think he was always thinking about the things that, that concerned him at work, but he, he could enjoy himself and get away. He just wasn't a very exuberant or demonstrative person, but for example, he'd go down to, to Augusta to watch golf. Never played. I don't think he probably had the patience for it. Why am I wasting my time? You know, it's kind of a, I mean, he, he rode horses until it got a, a trifle painful for him. But uh, he knew how to get away from the office and do other things. I, dis I did discover one, one little insight. I found only one person reading his, his correspondence uh, that he addressed by his first name. Uh, Marshall was famous for using people's last names, and it wasn't derogatory. I think it's just this habit. And it was uh, 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 well, Frank McCarthy, the, the movie producer, the guy who was behind the movie Patton, and, you know, he's very well known. But he was always Frank in correspondence, while everybody else was by their last name, even people he'd known. He could have called Omar Bradley Omar, but it was, it was always Dear Bradley, you know, you know, no titles or anything else. Uh, my father worked in the Pentagon during World War II, and uh, uh, I think everybody who had to deal with or work with General Marshall was impressed by his even-handedness. There was a real purpose for him using the 
not using people's titles or, or their first names. Uh, uh, most of you have heard this story where Franklin Roosevelt called him George one time, and he's frozen cold, you know. Oh, Mr. President, uh, please use my title or my last name. You know, Roosevelt kind of, he's a first name kind of guy, you know, and it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of set, him, set him back, but it, uh, I think he made his, his point. Marshall, of course, enjoyed good relationships with most of the military leaders that he dealt with. One exception, <laughs> Douglas MacArthur. Um, his relations with Omar Bradley seemed to have been cordial and one of mutual respect. Uh, Bradley was a known quantity as chief of staff of the U.S. Army, so when he became chairman, uh, he enjoyed the friendship and trust of both the president and uh, and General Marshall. What's interesting is that Marshall never developed a huge staff of any kind. Uh, you can probably name the people he worked closely, most closely with on about one hand. Uh, I think what he didn't quite realize was that, in fact, he began the tendency to concentrate power among the civilian office holders in the Department of Defense in the office of Secretary of Defense. That uh, in just one year, uh, he certainly managed to shift power to his office away from that of the service secretaries. I think they realized it, they trusted him, and uh, it really did start a, a pattern of shifting power away from the individual service departments to the office of the Secretary of Defense, which you may have noticed has chugged along unabated <laughs> ever, ever since. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting because Marshall really resisted the idea of reorganization. He, he caught on to something pretty important, I think, during World War II, which was the usual cure in Washington for settling an issue was to reorganize. Now, it may have been relevant, it may not, but if you had something that you couldn't figure out, reorganize. <laughs> and, and in fact, there was reorganization 47, 48, 49 before Marshall became Secretary of Defense, and then starting with Lovett and his period as Secretary of Defense, this chugged along to the point where we had, I think, eventually 12 different Assistant Secretaries of Defense, uh, one office out of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs ended up being another State Department, essentially. And that's something I think that uh, uh, Marshall did begin, and whether he realized the trends, uh, I think he probably did and felt that they were uh, fundamentally unavoidable. I'll talk a little bit more about that later when I talk about the Mutual Security Act that was passed during his tenure as SecDef. Lovett, for one, did believe that from his experience that reorganization or reorganization was essential and certainly the leaders of the Army, uh, Joe Collins, Matthew Ridgway, Maxwell D. Taylor, uh, felt that reorganization had to occur if the Army was to survive, because if it didn't happen, then the Department of the Air Force and the Department of the Navy would continue to enjoy special relations with Congress, which meant bigger budgets for procurement. I'm sure some of you know that it's a lot easier to buy weapons than it is to get more people. <laughs> that is the fact of life. One of the things I think that characterized General Marshall's tenure, however, was to keep issues in the building. Uh, I think he was quite aware of the fact that if you allowed Congress to take the initiative in many defense issues, you probably would end up with a some results you really didn't want. To remind everybody, there was a Democratic majority in the Congress during General Marshall's tenure as Secretary of Defense. Uh, it wasn't a very large majority, however. Uh, what was being stalled, to some degree, was the death of the New Deal and the death of the Fair Deal. Uh, the elections of 1950 
uh, congressional elections resulted in additional uh, Republican senators and congressmen. Five Senate seats passed to uh, Republicans, uh, 28 in the House. It's not terrible for an off-year election, but it was not, uh, uh, not good. The Senate during Marshall's tenure had 49 Democratic members, 47 Republicans. The House, 20, 235 Democrats, 199 Republicans. Power had largely moved to the Southern Conservatives with, in alliance with moderate Northern Senators, who happened to be the larger losers in the election of 1950. Scott Lucas from Illinois, for example, was uh, uh, lost. Marshall understood that his relations with Congress carried some baggage, which was he was being blamed, along with Atchison, for the fall of the nationalist Chinese government and their departure for Taiwan. He also was perfectly aware of the fact that to be confirmed, he needed the <coughs> Senate to uh, temporarily suspend Section 202A of the National Security Act of 1947, which ruled that no retired military officer could hold the position of Secretary of Defense unless he had had 10 years as being civilianized you know, in retirement. Uh, Marshall is, in fact, the only Secretary of Defense who was a former general. And, you know, the part of the legislation still stands. Uh, Jim Mattis was, only the, was the last one who, uh, again, they had to suspend 202A to, to confirm General Mattis. 600 or 116 senators and representatives voted against Marshall's confirmation. And he was perfectly aware of the fact that, that uh, he had detractors within the, within the, the Congress. He, he profited from the fact that his Republican opposition was really split into, as far as I can tell, three different schools. One are people who were really isolationist. That's the Robert A. Taft group. Um, they're not just unilateralists, they just don't want anything to do with, you know, any kinds of foreign entanglements. Then there's a very active group of Asia Firsters who don't like Europe. Uh, William Noland of California, who might as well have been the senator from Formosa, uh, <laughs> was a leader, very outspoken leader. And there were a number of people, Walter Judd of Minnesota, for example, who had missionary ties in China and others who were sure that the American government had really blown it by allowing the communists to take over uh, China. Then you have the internationalists, the, what used to be known as the Republicans, uh, the, the Rockefeller Republicans, they can call them salt and stall Republicans or whatever, but the people who had promoted ties with Europe, supported the Marshall Plan, NATO, and they were loyal and useful. People who really held power, however, were people whose loyalties could be negotiated. Most powerful people being John Stennis, Richard Russell, and Lyndon Johnson, with some others as well. So the Southern Democrats had, by seniority and inclination, pretty powerful influence on American defense policy. And I think Marshall knew that, he understood that, and he made sure that, uh, particularly that Richard Russell, was, who was head of the Senate Armed Services Committee with people he could work with. Marshall worked very hard on his relationships with Congress and he was quite, I think, successful in, in being nonpartisan or at least not allowing electoral politics to influence decisions. He was perfectly aware of the fact that they did and he was perfectly aware of the fact that if he could manipulate that to his advantage, uh, he could and would but strengthening this party or that party or this congressman or that senator was not something that was high on his agenda. Let me turn now to Marshall's defense priorities, just to run through those briefly. Uh, a mixed picture, 
Uh, NATO and relations within NATO, I think, stand out as one of his great successes. Um, here you see, really see the, the hidden hand. Marshall and people in the Defense Department were convinced that unless the Germans rearmed, NATO had no military future. And, Mar and Marshall was very active in at least promoting the idea of German rearmament in the face of both British and French opposition. There are a number of ways that he advanced this. One was getting Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed as the first saccure, uh, which was not as easy as it seems in retrospect. It was almost uh, essential that you pleased the Brits and at least pacified the French momentarily. And, and, and the thing that pleased the Brits and pacified the French were very different and uh, some, some tough trade-offs there. Marshall, to some degree, I think this is interesting, was, was important in seeing that Greece and Turkey join the alliance, which gave him client states in the sense that he could count on supporting what tended to be American uh, positions. The sneaky thing is that he got Spain and Yugoslavia to be, for all intents and purposes, de facto members of NATO, uh, largely through the manipulation of military assistance. Um, so in a sense, that he continued to put pressure upon the British and the French by adding members to NATO or even getting as Spain and Yugoslavia any people who were certainly likely to take American positions. In the spring of 1951, um, he was successful in getting congressional approval to send four divisions uh, to Europe and plus additional forces to really create an American presence. And he knew that if the larger the American presence was in NATO, the more influence the United States would have on NATO policy. He understood that quite well. And it's clear that by the time he left being Secretary of Defense, he had created a, a, a larger leverage over NATO policy, which eventually led to the Lisbon Agreement in 1952, which is a, you know, a statement, pretty clear statement of what our expectations were for European rearmament. In the United States, he worked very hard to prepare the country for a long period of military readiness unknown in our history. It's well to remember that within the year that he served as Secretary of Defense, the defense budget increased by a factor of three or four, depending on what you count, and that the forces on active duty again create a change by a factor of three. He also was responsible to some degree by, for the enactment and execution of the Defense Production Act of um, late 1950, which is often overlooked, but it's actually the beginning of an attempt to establish a, a permanent relationship with corporations who were involved in defense production. I think it's pretty telling that by the the time that Marshall left office, 408 corporations that had been involved in defense work during World War II had returned to doing defense contracting. December of 1950, after the Chinese intervention, uh, with Marshall's approval, the president authorized the creation of the Office of Defense Mobilization and put um, uh, Charles Wilson from General Electric in charge. Uh, Wilson, in fact, had earlier experience in the War Department. Marshall's greatest project, I think, in his own mind, was the passage of the Universal Military Training and Service Act in June of 1951. We never had universal military training, but at least the passage of this act sort of regularized and, and uh, rationalized conscription and then in reality use conscription as a way to recruit people for the reserve. Those of us, and I think we are numerous in this crowd, can remember that reserve units during the Vietnam War were just 
full of volunteers, you know, who were going to serve their country for six months, and then six or seven years in the reserve establishment. So in the long run, it didn't quite get universal military training, but this, I think there's no question that that act, followed by reserve reform legislation, did allow the country to build up uh, reserve forces that could be uh, deployed, although not, not immediately. Marshall was also a player in the creation of the Mutual Security Act, June of July 1951, which merged economic and military assistance, uh, which at the time was about eight, eight billion dollars uh, a, a year, which was a lot of money, 1951. Uh, he was concerned because it looked like the State Department might run all of mutual security programs, but there was an office, the Office of Military Assistance within the office of the Secretary of Defense, which certainly protected the military's uh, interest. So if you put these together, you have manpower mobilization, military assistance, and defense production. I don't think much is left out when you talk about putting together a sort of a, a, an organization, commitments that were uh, certainly developed long-term uh, military strength. Um, I couldn't find a whole lot of interest in Marshall's uh, writings or his papers in, in matters nuclear. I think that's, that's kind of interesting. I'm sure he was perfectly aware of it, except that I think that he was not convinced that preparing for nuclear war was the only thing that the country needed. He was a kind of NSC 68 guy who, who believed that the conventional forces in the long run would be uh, essential. I think he over emphasize the necessity for a large army. Why wouldn't he? You know, it was like an admiral not believing in submarines or battleships. But, but that's about the, the most critical thing I think we said about it. Talk about Marshall and American policy in Asia. Marshall had a fresh experience. And sometimes forget he spent virtually two years in China trying to figure out if there was any way to get the nationalists and the communists to uh, cooperate. The answer, of course, was no. Uh, he continued to take an interest in MacArthur's activities as SCAP in, uh, in Japan. Um, his relations with Asia experts in the State Department, as far as I can tell, were, were quite good. Um, he accepted the fact there were going to be at least two Chinas for the, the near future. After the start of the Korean War, he in fact agreed that we should do more to defend Formosa. But defending Formosa was an instrument to get help for the Koreans and the Japanese. You couldn't get anything through Congress unless you gave something to the Chinese nationalists. Uh, military assistance to Japan or Korea didn't pass 1949, 1950. But all you have to do is add some program for Formosa, and then suddenly the Congress thinks this is really a, really a good idea. Marshall agreed with the Joint Chiefs of Staff that there should be very, no really big deals with the uh, the Kuomintang and Taiwan. Um, I think there were no great expectations that the Chinese nationalist military forces would be any help at all anywhere, certainly not soon. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think he had to compromise much to see that there might be a role uh, for Formosa or Taiwan um, within uh, the American de sort of defense perimeter. We sometimes forget two things. One, the Taiwanese had been deeply affected by the fact that they had been a Japanese colony since 1895. And that many of the Taiwanese believed that they were more like the Japanese than they were like the Chinese. Another thing we sometimes forget is the Chinese nationalists invaded Taiwan in 1948, 1949 and took it in the midst of a very bloody pacification campaign, uh, which certainly made relations on the island uh, somewhat difficult. 
I know of at least one case where a president of Taiwan spoke better Japanese than he did Chinese. And, and the Chinese uh, today on the mainland continue to be n very nervous about the fact that they think that Taiwanese are either too American or too Japanese you know, to be uh, regarded as, quote, real Chinese. Uh, I'll be very quick. I had a, a Chinese foreign policy official in Beijing uh, tell me that um, the United States was not even handed in its treatment of Japan and China, that we favored the Japanese. The Japanese had bought uh, the, their way into the American economy and they took money and stuff. He said, we just had to be more even-handed. It's about 25 years ago. And I said, well, what would you suggest would bring this about? He said, oh, it's very simple. Just give us Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I think, first of all, that's unlikely. Uh, but I'm not sure Taiwan is ours to give to anybody, you know. Uh, oh, it's, it was an eye-opener, I'll say that. But in Beijing, they have a big clock they put out in Tiananmen Square, which is the, the reversion countdown. And they did that for Hong Kong. They did it for Macau. I think we have to worry if they put one up for Taiwan. I think that would not be a, a good omen. Marshall took a great interest in the, the creation of a new Japan. And he was very active, in fact, in, in trying to develop uh, uh, a new Japanese uh, military establishment. He had no problem with MacArthur's creating what's known as the Japanese uh, National Police Reserve. It's really the Japanese army. And in fact, uh, pushed policies that were designed to, to make Japan part of a uh, anti-communist security network. Uh, Marshall and sold the treaty that was eventually passed in 1951 to, to Ridgeway and to the JCS, who had some doubts about it. There was quite an issue over base rights, as a matter of fact. MacArthur actually had said, we should have a security arrangement with Japan, but no base rights. Huh? That had been a little tough. He did settle for the fact that he thought that we should pay more to the Japanese. It was, one of the things that John Foster Dulles did in 1950, the reason he went to Asia, was to start working on the problem of straightening out this base rights uh, difficulty. The Brits wanted a very punitive treaty, and most of the Commonwealth countries, Canadians and others, you know, felt that we hadn't really punished the Japanese enough for World War II. Needless to say, the Chinese nationalists <laughs> thought that we should have a nice punitive treaty. Most of everybody believing that Japan would become a great industrial power, and they wanted a, a cut uh, of Japan's economic uh, miracle. Uh, Marshall, in fact, resisted that, as did the State Department. Uh, it's kind of interesting, particularly given our experience in Iraq. Uh, General Marshall was a, a major player in de-purging Japanese officers and putting them back in, into the military establishment. It's very clever. They decided that the cutoff was July of 1937. If people were commissioned after that, they couldn't be held responsible for bad criminal behavior by the Japanese armed forces. Now, they couldn't be war criminals, but the point was they were forced into service the minute the war with Japan began, and therefore they shouldn't be seen as people who were so deeply imbued with the, uh, the samurai values that they couldn't serve in a democratic military establishment. That basically allowed 100,000 foreign or, or Japanese, or former Japanese officers then became eligible to serve in the self-defense force. And that was you know, terrifically important in making sure that they had not only four divisions, but eventually six divisions planned you know, in, you know, and located mostly in Hokkaido by the time Marshall left office. Well, you probably thought I'd never get to Korea. Okay. Well, it saved the best for last, I guess. Um, 
Marshall supported the intervention and, and met, in fact, with the president and most of his advisors in the first three days of July 1950. So even before he took office, he was well briefed on, on what was going on. And he shared the general optimism that uh, you know, we would be able eventually to stop the North Koreans short of complete domination of South Korea. Um, he also, when he took office, approved of the UN General Assembly resolution of 7 October, which called for the unification of Korea by occupation of North Korea. He, by and large, supported uh, MacArthur and his various uh, uh, initiatives. Um, I think it's not generally known that the JCS actually drew up a plan that looks a lot like Inchon. You know, before you know, they actually had to deal with the, that choice. And there's a, you know, a strategy that I think was pretty, pretty forward-looking as to just how many troops would be necessary. And nobody foresaw the Chinese intervention, at least that I can find. But nevertheless, it was a pretty solid Pentagon work. Marshall, of course, did not go to Wake Island on October 15th of 1950 to meet with MacArthur. Um, I wouldn't read too much into that. He and Atchison had to be at a NATO defense minister's meeting on October 13th through the 18th. And I don't think either one of them had a taste for dealing with MacArthur anyway. And I think most of them recognized that this was more photo op uh, than anything else. Although. I don't think it's widely known that Abel Harriman actually got there a day early and briefed MacArthur on the agenda, the reason MacArthur was there and didn't salute, I guess that people still argue about that, uh, was the fact that he got there early enough so that Harriman, in fact, went over the agenda with him and made sure that they were more or less going to agree on everything. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the records that were kept, the Wake Island meeting, the surprising thing is they don't talk about Korea very much. It's about rehabilitation of Korea after the war is won. It's about China. It's about Japan. Um, there's not much in there at all about Korea, but remember that they thought the war was won on the 15th of October. It wasn't pre-Chinese intervention. I think that uh, Marshall was far less militant about uh, being aggressive both towards the communists and towards Douglas MacArthur than Atchison, Harriman, and Bradley. In fact, in many cases, uh, Marshall warned the rest of them, say, okay, you want to get rid of MacArthur, but I will tell you, we're going to have real problems politically with that. And it may very well cost us a lot of votes for NATO military assistance or all kinds of things the Congress can do, you know, if they take up the, uh, the cudgel for MacArthur. Marshall also had considerable influence in advancing Matthew B. Ridgway's career, um, putting him in escape, escape sink UNC. Um, it's kind of interesting. Ridgway did not want to go to NATO. Ridgway wanted to be chief of staff of the Army. And basically, he was told that he was going to have to do the theater job in Asia first and probably go to NATO to replace Eisenhower if Eisenhower decided to become political. And uh, Ridgway was anything but a simple soldier. Uh, left rather considerable papers, which were Carlisle Military History Institute. So the, the real Matthew Ridgway is. Uh, somewhat more complicated than most people realize. Ridgway fact. The reason he had such good po posture was he had a back brace on most of the time. He ruined the lower part of his back doing something athletic. It wasn't, and he was a bad athlete. That also, <laughs> uh, he, he injured. It wasn't parachuting or anything. He already had that problem before he did parachuting. And so the, the General Ridgway was always sort of, he kept his weight down for obvious reasons. Anybody has back problems? Everybody raise your hand with back problems? Yeah, I think there's probably some out there. Uh, knows that uh, 
exercise, although it can do so much, but if you, you know, start putting on a lot of weight, then you're going to be uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, it's not that I don't think General Ridgway was a piece of work as a commander. I think he was, but he was also very clever as a commander and far more complex than uh, the, the image he liked to project. I met him when he was in his 80s, and I'm telling you, he was a presence. I mean, this guy had, you know, he had, he had it. You know, there was an aura about him. Even if you didn't know all of his achievements, there was, you could understand why he had the kind of impact he did on, on soldiers and upon his peers. In conclusion, very quickly, I think Marshall had probably as productive a single year as Secretary of Defense as one could imagine. For somebody who was tired, illish, 69 years old, um, he did a lot. Um, I think he, he adhered to uh, kind of an old adverb, or ad, whatever, uh, motto that if you don't care about who gets the credit, you'd be surprised how much you can do. And I think he worked on that, on that principle and worked that way very effectively. I think NATO was far better for his interest in it. His biggest disappointment was the failure of universal military training, but I think that was, that was a pipe dream that he developed with John Macaulay Palmer right after World War I. He never surrendered it. Um, it just wasn't something the United States was like to, uh, to adopt. It did bring about reserve reform eventually. I think that he left the office, the Secretary of Defense, far stronger than he found it. And he also empowered the chairman of the JCS to a degree that probably needed to be done. Uh, he did reduce service influence in Congress, and that was, uh, if a limited uh, success, was still a success nonetheless. So there we have George C. Marshall as SecDef, and it's well to remember this was his third major time in office, and, and uh, I think it's certainly one that deserves uh, as much appreciation as his uh, service as Chief of Staff of the Army or Secretary of State. Thank you very much.